Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Hello, fellow Knife Junkie, and welcome to episode number 54 of the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Jim, the Knife Newbie Person. And I'm Bob DeMarco. Welcome to the podcast. The Knife Junkie Podcast and the KnifeJunkie.com. It's the place for knife newbies and knife junkies to learn about knives and knife collecting and hear from knife designers, makers, manufacturers, reviewers, and anyone who loves knives. And Bob, we've got a pair of brothers on the show today, our interview show today, that are are, are doing that. They love knives and uh, kind of doing it, Um, I was going to say, on the side, which sounds like it's a hobby. But they have full-time careers and a full-time knife-making business, if you will. And that's right. Today we're talking to Terrell and Seth Todd of Todd Knife and Tools. You know Terrell as Zelric42, famed knife reviewer on YouTube. He also had uh, Apex uh, News with an Edge, which was a knife news show uh, mm-hmm. on YouTube, and he had a knife podcast for a while. Terrell is just, uh, well, let's just say he's neck deep in knives, and he really knows his stuff. And he and his brother Seth have been designing. Uh, on CAD and also creating in the shop with their very own hands, uh, prototypes for some really incredible flippers that have now been turned into knives produced by Wii and Best Tech. Uh, they have the Roxy, the Roxy 4, and the Malware out. Those are made by, uh, Best Tech and Wii, uh, respectively. And, uh, these guys are, were knife fans who just really turned their criticism into creativity. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? They, they, they took things that they liked and th- took things that they didn't like about knives and, uh, just started making their own. Turned them into things they did like. That's right. That's right. And, uh, someone from the, um, Southern Renaissance, it may have been Michelangelo. I, I can't remember who said this, but said, criticize through creating. In other mm-hmm. words, don't just sit around and bitch about, oh, this knife should be better here or it should have a choil. Make your own. Do something about it. Yep. Yeah. And they did. They did. We'll get to that interview in just a sec, but I want to remind you that uh, if you've got a small business, whatever it is, knife making or anything else, you can take managing that small business and those finances to the next level. Focus on growing your biz while QuickBooks Online handles everything else. Use this special link to get 50% off your subscription. Just go to thenifejunkie.com slash QuickBooks. You'll get 50% off either QuickBooks Online or QuickBooks Self-Employed for the first six months. Get started with QuickBooks Self-Employed or QuickBooks Online today. Again, 50% off if you use our special link, the knifejunkie.com slash QuickBooks. You know you're a knife junkie if you answer to the nickname Blade. All right, I'm here with Terrell and Seth Todd of Todd Knife and Tool. You know Terrell as Zelric42 on YouTube. He reviews knives and has a, a new show about knives. And his brother, Seth, he is also a knife guy. They are partners in Todd Knife and Tool. Guys, welcome to the show. Thanks, Bob. Thanks. We're, we're glad to be here. Yep. Uh, it's my pleasure to have you. I've been watching, well, I've been watching you, Terrell, for quite a while on YouTube, but uh, just really paying attention to the Todd Knife and Tool knives that have been coming out. The first one that, that really uh, hit my frontal lobe was uh, the Malware, and then I just saw your uh, video on the Roxy, which is right up my alley. Explain to me, guys, explain to me how you went from knife enthusiasts to uh, knife makers and uh, owners of a knife company. Uh, Seth is probably better to start with that story because, well, go ahead, Seth. Yeah, I mean, I think Terrell was into the YouTube videos and all of that stuff kind of before I was. And I have always carried a knife, but had never really gone beyond like Spyderco Delica, Spyderco Endura, um, kind of all of that was was what I just carried all my life um and in the military and uh but I remember whenever we were small kids uh our our dad used to you know make build fabricate all kinds of stuff in the shop behind the house we were down uh at the family junkyard that might sound strange for some <laughs> people but there was a family junkyard in in Sparta Missouri and uh, we were there one day and we were looking through a bunch of parts. And my dad found some leaf springs and he said, you know, you can make a knife out of these. And of course, I was like, well, let's do that right right now. And uh, turned out never did. And uh, dad passed away kind of young. And 
never happened. I was sitting at home just letting YouTube play while I was working one night. And this guy, you guys probably know him, uh, Michael Gavko, mm -hmm. um, was on YouTube doing crazy, making a knife in his, in his garage with the dirt and sand and, and grinding dust everywhere. And I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to do that. I want to make a knife. Um, so I went to work the next day and I have a development team that works with me and I, a software development team. I was like, yeah, I think I'm going to make a knife. And, and I pulled up. They were like, what kind of knife? And I was like, I don't know. Pulled up custom knives on Google and uh, um, the Praetorian, Greg Medford Praetorian came up. I was like, I don't know, something like that. And they pretty much laughed at me. And then, you know, I kind of told Terrell, I was like, I'm going to try and do this. He was like, okay. And I don't know, Terrell, it was probably about a year later and probably about $40,000 poorer. <laughs> I, I think I came up with the first knife. One of those knives you gave away, right? Yeah, yeah, we that, did. That looked a lot like a Praetorian in a way. Uh, that was a fixed blade. And then um, that wasn't the goal. The goal was to make a folding knife. I wanted to make something I could carry myself. And then I think uh, that Chris, around that December, me and my girlfriend at the time drove up to actual Springfield, Missouri, where Terrell's at. And... Uh, uh, picked up a mill, like a, a manual mini mill from, uh, uh, what's the place up there, Terrell? Grizzly. Um, Grizzly. Drove it back in my truck and then, and then kind of went from there. Wow. You, you, the first thing you got was a mill. Well, no, 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 no. The first thing I got, and this is for anybody who's trying to get into this, um, and it's changed, I think, a little bit in the last four or five years, but whenever I started trying to get into it, Makers are like the most secretive people in the world. Like they don't want to tell you anything about how, I mean, not like I said, it's changed some, but at the time they don't want to tell you anything about how they make knives or anything like that. And I bought all the wrong stuff. I mean, I started with uh angle grinder and uh, like the worst belt grinder you've ever seen. And then yeah. I bought this thing from uh, what's the knife uh, knife work or knife supply store here. That's in Houston which they do some great stuff, but they have this beginner's knife uh, grinding uh, grinder. Horrible thing could probably kill you in a matter <laughs> yeah. of seconds. Yeah, it's under my workbench right now. Yeah, not Dying something I would suggest to anybody. I tried that. That was a horrible deal. Um, and I got a grinder. That was the first thing from Northridge Tool. Great guys over at Northridge. They've done us uh, really good and they, they have really great product. That was the first thing. I think once I made a few of those fixed blade knives, then we moved. Then then I went and got the mill. Just basically said, I'm not going to be able to do this without a mill. We share a lot of this stuff, like the uh, Northridge grinders. That's what we both got. But now, we do differ on kilns. I have an even heat kiln, and he has a Paragon, and I think we're both pretty much stuck on our kilns and wouldn't switch. Oh. If we were in a shop together, we would still have two different kilns. Well, do they have do they have different properties or or they just do the same thing? You just like how they interface better. Uh, I like the interface on mine. He likes the interface on his. Yeah, they're probably both fine. I just build quality. The aesthetic of the Paragon, I think, is better. Yeah, he <laughs> is right about that. Mine's all chrome and shiny and looks like a kitchen appliance, and his is all looks like a medieval torture chamber device <laughs> or something. Yeah. <laughs> Something suitable I didn't even for plan to get mine. I was at uh, Jantz, Jantz, Jantz Supply. Jantz, yeah. We drove, me and my girlfriend drove up to Jantz from here one one weekend, and they had just gotten back from Blade Show the week before. At that point, I still didn't even really know what Blade Show was. And uh, they had a demo model of, a, of one that was coming out. And, uh, and I asked if they would sell it to me, and they said, yeah, sure, why not? And I bought it. So do you guys do all of your own – let's flash forward to now because look, just looking at the quality of what you've called prototypes online, um, do you make all of those in your own shop? They look pretty sophisticated. Yes. Yeah, it started out um, – like I started trying to make – some. if you go way back down on the old Instagram page, you'll find some that probably aren't so sophisticated. <laughs> I mean Instagram lighting <laughs> might make them look okay, but they weren't, they weren't the most fantastic. Started out trying to make them without CAD. Got a couple that were reasonable that worked, um, but it, it wasn't going to happen. And then had to learn CAD, um, spent some time learning CAD. 
And then the the thing that is, and I won't say this is always the case, but I think is interesting about the way we do it. There are a lot of designers out there that they just design, they draw a whole bunch of drawings. They might pass drawings to a production company or they do drawings and they work with somebody with CAD to get a CAD drawing. We generally will design the knife, make and get it to where we want it in CAD, make the knife, actually produce a handmade version, which for what it's worth, if I do that, usually takes me anywhere from about 40 to 60 hours of labor. Hmm. And it's a lot of that is because you're just making these one off, right? There are no jigs. There's no anything. Hmm. It's the first time every time. And then we'll take that production knife to the production company and, and we'll actually let them put it in hand after we've taken it out and used it. And there might be like some of the knives, I think I've made three or four different versions of the prototypes by hand before they actually, like the Roxy, I think had three prototype versions before it actually went to a production company and, and we said, hey, this is this is the one. And that's yeah. changed a little bit with the advent. You're missing one of the major things we do now is both of us, well, both of us have FDM 3D printers and that works into checking size, ergos, all that. And, uh, and then for final knives to take to these production companies, I've now got a DLP printer, uh, Prusa SL1 that uh, we will use because we can take the plastic knife made out of the, S the DLP printer mm -hmm. that is spot on to what the real knife would be, and we can hand it to, especially if we're having production done in Asia, mm -hmm. we can hand it to them, and then they can actually take that one home because it's not a knife. Right. So yeah. they can see what it really is supposed to look like while they're working on their end of the CAD and all that. L let me back up for a second. You talk about using CAD, and then you talk about hand-making it. To me, uh, as a, as a non-knife maker, and certainly as a non-CAD guy, um, I always uh, was under the impression that you, you design it in CAD, you create a file in CAD, and then you stuff that thing in a mill, and it produces the knife for you. Boom. Ah, no. <laughs> Now the mill, the, the mill that I have doesn't even have what's called a DRO, which is a digital readout. So it's a hundred percent manual, meaning that there's a bunch of little tick marks all over that thing, and you've got to count, um, which right. makes some things extremely difficult. So the first knives, and it, as Terrell pointed out, things are a little bit different um, now. I've got a laser also that's kind of incorporated into this, but the first right. knives, um, what you do is you bring them into CAD. You get the models, you turn the models into drawings, and then you print those out on a card stock. And then you take uh, and you cut those out with either a razor knife or scissors. And then you uh, take Super 77 and mm -hmm. uh, you'll glue those down to a piece of titanium and a piece of steel. Well, hang on here. Super 77 is just an adhesive. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And like then, spray. Yeah. yeah. And then... Uh, go out and then what I generally would do is cut cut all the pieces down to reasonable size close to close to what they're going to be bait and then glue those on there and then you go through with a manual mill and you actually drill and counter bore and countersink all of the holes for uh, the handle scales and the blade etc and then uh, you go to a grinder from there well, normally you get a bandsaw first, and then you go to a grinder and shape everything by hand. Exactly up to the contours of the paper, and and that's where you're getting your precision. That's where yeah. the payoff is from using CAD, right? Right. If you don't do the CAD, like the big problem with that is you won't know whether that knife is actually going to lock or not. If you just do it on paper, I mean, you can get lucky or you can play with cardboard and, and pieces of wood and stuff. But in CAD, I can I can define whether a knife is going to lock or not, whether the flipping action is going to work, how well the flipping action is going to work before I ever even print it to a piece of paper. Well, so, uh, Terrell, describe to me the design process. We, you've got two talents here uh, and your brothers. How does that work? One of us will start with a concept, an idea for the shape or whatever. And uh, as you've, we've talked about a little bit before, you kind of know where we're coming from from watching the videos we're always looking for a usable shape, a shape that is going to be mostly comfortable in the hand. And that's not 100% for us. Being usable is the, the first thing. 
and then make it comfortable to use. Uh, and, and once we've got a base shape set down, then we go back and forth inside CAD. You can share it. We use Fusion 360, so you can share the CAD files. Uh, they're cloud storage type deal where I can mess with the CAD file, then Seth can mess with the CAD file, and back and forth. And uh, from there, we refine the knife down. Now, currently, Seth does do the final, like he was talking about, on the lockup, making sure that's all going to work out right. And a couple of the other really technical things that I haven't caught up on yet. Hmm. So it's a collaboration between the two of us on getting to a final design. But uh, the designs basically come out of, is it going to be useful? You know, there are other designers out there that make things that are really cool to look at. And uh, for Seth and I, there's there's very little of that. If it's not going to be useful, then it's... There's no point yeah. in making it. Now, I will say the caveat to that probably, and this turned out like a happy coincidence, was the malware. Yeah. I had I had designed, not that we've had that many of these made, but I had designed a ton of knives that were like specifically needs to work this way. It needs to fit in the hand this way. And, and I sat down one night and did the malware. And I was like, I just want something that looks cool and, and stabby. <laughs> and believe it or not, though, it turned out to be one of the most useful um, like day to day carry, especially for a gentleman's carry knife. And it turned out to be really, but that honestly wasn't the intention whenever that one was done. You kind of allude to, well, you didn't allude, you said straight out, uh, function comes first. And, and I believe that, but you have such a strong design language. Uh, the Todd knife and tools, I feel like I've seen three of them now, the malware, the Roxy, and then one that preceded them both, I believe, that had a shorter blade, but they all look like brothers or cousins you know they're all of the same family yeah the the original was the roxy and the one you just saw in the last couple of days was the roxy four. Oh, okay all right and yeah that that's a very interesting thing whenever we were doing this and getting started with everything we talked about we need to have a design language that says this is a todd knife and tool knife and we're working off of manual mills so making some kind of funny curves or certain flourishes and that sort of stuff was kind of out. Because with a manual mill, you can do all that stuff, but it takes a lot of time. And straight lines are relatively easy. They're not easy to line up, you know, from side to side. Right. But they're still a lot easier than a bunch of crazy flourishes or something. So, Seth, I don't remember what model it was. Was it, it may have been the Master Chief that you did it to first. But, yeah, I'm uh, trying to remember. I think it was either the, it might have been the second prototype of the Roxy. But Seth was, we had talked about it, and Seth was out in the shop messing with one of the prototypes, and he ran down and did these lines that you now know as the Todd Knife and Tool design language. Right. And... We looked at it and we're like, hey, that's pretty freaking cool. And yeah. And then since then, on any knife that's angular, we try to stay with that. And it's for the customer, as well as us. But it's for the customer so that they know what they're getting. No matter mm -hmm. who's, whether it says Best Tech or we or whoever right. on it, they look at it and they know they're getting a Todd Knife and Tool knife, even though it's a completely different design than whatever the other companies have got. All those straight lines and channels, I feel like there are channels. Obviously, there are fullers in the blades. Right. And and uh, there are lines and kind of terraced areas in the mm -hmm. handles. They all look like they aid to grip. They definitely have a strong uh, aesthetic identity, you know. But they also look like they're meaningful, not just yeah. like you were trying to put in. Yeah. Uh, lines to make it look. Well, I would say there's a lot of stuff. And, and yeah, I agree with you. I mean, they, it wasn't just, Hey, let me just go see what I can get in here. I think they, they had an intention to be there. Um, right. uh, like influencers that probably that Tashi might get upset if I say this, cause me and him actually disagree on a bunch of design stuff, but, <laughs> um, I like the way Tashi, um, makes every kind of line fit together whenever the knife is closed or the knife is open. So I try to stick to, a similar point of view, unless it, 
where we'll disagree is for him, it's probably like, hey, it really doesn't matter whether it impacts the function of the knife. It's got to be that way. Whereas I'll say, hey, no, the knife's got to have a better function. If that means one of these lines isn't going to be perfect, then, then that's got to change. But there's a lot of additional stuff outside of just that those handle scale cuts. You'll notice there's always on the flipper knives, there's always a landing pad for your finger behind the knife. Yes. So if you want to flip all day long, you can flip all day long. There's always a dual cutout on both sides of the inside of the handle scales for ambidextrous operation of the knife. Both both Terrell and I are both ambidextrous. So that's there to make sure that you can open it easy. You don't get that like I got to cram my thumb down in here between these okay. these two yeah. scales. And, and that's actually something that came up as we were designing <clears throat> knives is the frustration. And at the time, we both generally carried a lockback spider co. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that was more about the fact that that knife is a hundred percent ambidextrous than it was style or pre preference or anything like that. Because for both of us, the frustration of a knife that can't be manipulated well with the left hand mm -hmm. is, is huge. And uh, so as we were designing, even in the beginning and now that was a, one of the major sticky points was to make sure. Another point that we do is if you look across one of our knives from uh, lock side to show side, the show side is not raised and the lock side is not lowered at the lock interface. Yes. And that's for ambidextrous, and that's also so that you don't disengage the knife accidentally, like was a ZT had a, a big kerfluffle about one of their knives that people were claiming was bad design because it opened on them. It wasn't. You're not supposed to torque things with your knife. Right. But we thought we'd just eliminate that by not having that feature in there and putting those cuts. You mentioned that in, in the recent uh, video you put out on the Roxy 4. You actually show that. And uh, not only does it seem to, to be uh, uh, functional in terms of making it kind of equal for lefties and righties, but it, it's also cleaner. It just cleans up the design. It's already an immaculate design, but but that little aspect of not having that little dip or swale there just keeps it keeps the design pure. Yeah, oh, it, it, it does, and we agree. But it also lights up the other reviewers out there that just it's hilarious, but it, yeah. also fun. There's a lot of attention paid to detail on that stuff. Like when you unlock the knife and you bring the blade down, it should hit the thumb. Mm -hmm right after the detent goes off so you can you know to take your thumb out of the way and then close the knife. Um, just a lot of knife stuff for guys that use knives and play with the knives and fold flip knives all the time to make sure that it's a knife that's going to be enjoyable when you're doing all that stuff, but then also useful. Right. Yeah. You have, uh, you, uh, Terrell, you were talking about how you position the, um, the flipper tab uh, just, uh, well, I don't know how to... Uh, Cl as close to the end of the handle as possible so that forward of the pivot forward of the pivot yes thank you and uh that's how you're uh, that's how you kind of are allowed so to speak to use such a diminutive flipper tab that's how the flipper tab is able to work being so small is just the placement right absolutely the flipper tab on the roxy series is 13 and a half thousandths that's so small if you, it's just sheer leverage. If it's, yeah. and I don't, I don't even understand. There's a specific knife company that we've talked about working with and I've had the conversation with their designer. I don't know how many times because they screw this up pretty much every knife they make. It's just basic geometry and, and leverage. If it's in front of the pivot, then you're not going to have to put very much force to break the detent and be able to flip the knife out. If it's on top of the pivot, it's still okay. But if it's behind the pivot, then you have almost no leverage on the thing. And then you got to like be whacking it and flipping it out to get it out. Preload it with energy, pushing in the other direction, then release. Yeah, it's like. Right. Yeah, and, yeah. and that's 1300. So if I don't correct that, somebody's going to oh you know, <laughs> comments. So uh, the Warncliffe, you, you have a love for the Warncliffe. Now, I know you talk about uh, uh, the being functional. And uh, to me, a Warncliffe is a great blade shape for many, many different things. I, I agree with you, Bob, but we honestly do not make or have not designed a single worn clip. Okay, okay, I take it back because it's a little bit curved up towards the, the tip, I think, and that's technically not a worn cliff. Is that correct? Well, the knife company is always, and the knife 
resellers always mark them as a worn cliff, and yes, they do look like a worn cliff. Uh-huh. Because if you don't set any of them down on something to see that curve, uh-huh. you don't see the curve in the edge. Right. But none the of Roxy's, our go ahead, Seth. The Roxy's. I think the Roxy's is pretty much a straight edge, or the no, Roxy Four. Sorry, the Roxy Four. It's not either. I mean, it's close, but it's the, close. Yes, but they're they're modified one cliff is what you'd call it. Kind of like a sax. They're kind of like it's kind of like an old. Yeah, Viking yeah. sax. Got a little bit of curve. Greg Medford actually called the uh, Roxy Four uh, sax knife. Yeah. yeah. I, well, I agree. <laughs> I I agree. Every time he talks to us, is talks to us. It's always a saxy knife. The saxy knife. So, uh, what's that blade shape to you? Um, why well, why no Bowie's so far? Okay. So the reason for that is is the Warncliffe is a very usable blade, but if you're doing everyday stuff. You're always, any soft material you're cutting on a flat surface, you're always using the tip to cut with, if it's a straight worn cliff. Whenever we put that little kick up, that little curve at the end of the blade, whenever you do that, now you have that little bit of belly to draw against something, and you're not having to poke the end of the knife in there. And it's actually a thing for the customer, again, or the purchaser, because... Not everybody can sharpen a knife extremely well, and the points of a Warncliffe, mm-hmm. if you see the average knife guy's knife, the points of a Warncliffe are always rounded, and that's that's just the way it happens. So you don't have that pointy point if they have to sharpen that all the time. But if you give them a little bit of belly, then they'll they'll naturally use that little bit of belly. Their hand won't be in the awkward position, and uh, it's just a better experience. And I don't think we're stuck to it. I mean, no. if you look through the Instagram stuff, we've got, there's a few designs of the one cliff and then you got the malware, but it's just the ones that have gone production. I think probably my favorite kind of like useful is probably like a leaf shape mm-hmm. or almost a spear point. Right. And, and you've got an exploit, a showdown and a root kid. And is that OPSEC, Seth? Infosec. Infosec, that's right. OpSec's an, another one I'm working on. Uh, that none of those are worn cliffs. They're all either leaves or drop points. Cool. Well, I, I look forward to seeing how those kind of very organic shapes work into um, the rest of your kind of design language or, or whether it's going to be angular, if it's going to be that juxtaposition of angular and uh, organic. Don't tell me now. I want to wait and see. To your point there, Bob. Yeah. One of the things that's a value out of Terrell doing the channel and all the YouTube stuff and all the the podcasts that they do and everything is we get a lot of feedback around what people do or don't like about knives. Almost, I think, every single knife Terrell mentioned except for one, the CAD files are actually posted on Instagram, if not prototypes mm. of those knives already. And uh, the more people want to jump in and say, hey, this is what I don't like, this is what I'm not saying we're going to change it. But but the better the better feedback that we get. Um, the whole kind of concept of this out of the beginning was Terrell did this knife channel was to be able to take what the the viewers and the followers and everybody thought was going to be a good knife and be able to get that into production and be able to deliver something that was what everybody wanted. Yeah. Well, that yeah. that allow you to be nimble as a company too. Yeah. You know, we would love to fall on that uh, that XM18 or the Delica or whatever to have that continuous production knife. But well, we may or may not have found it yet. We don't know. But we're going to continue to iterate onto what the uh, community tells us. Now, granted, the, the base designs and concepts are going to come out of our nutty heads, but uh, the little things like... Uh, like not having a sharpening choil, which horribly upsets half the community and the other half of the community just absolutely loves. Yeah. Now, this half that loves it, we kind of fall on their side because we literally hate to stick a knife in a box or something and have it get caught. And, you know, and there's also tactical reasons for that that uh, probably shouldn't talk about. But No, you can talk about that stuff here. Clothing could easily get caught in a choil, I've, I've frequently thought. Some of the large choils, like I, I have some an XM18, that big old choil on that. If I were in that tactical situation and I needed to stick that knife into some soft stuff, 
mm-hmm. on the way back out, that big old choil is going to get caught and it's yep. going to cause me problems. <laughs> and that's a point in my life where I don't want problems. I want everything to work. It's just day to day. I go to stick stick the point of a knife into a, a you know an Amazon package and it gets caught on the choil. That just annoys the shit up. Um, <laughs> it's the one thing that I think everyone, almost all the videos, people bring it up and some of them complain, some of them don't complain. And that's probably the one thing that will never change. I, some of my favorite knives I won't carry on a daily basis because they have a big sharpening choil. And yeah. I get that some people have an issue with being able to sharpen, but the knife's meant to be used and that's not going to be the end all and be all of if you, you, you screw up the backside there on the sharpening. And, right. and if for some reason you absolutely need it, you can get a Dremel at Walmart for about 25 bucks. I think. Right. 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 And, and another thing, just, just so that we don't get a bunch of crazy feedback off this, we do have a couple of models that are coming out that do have a forward finger choil that's mm-hmm. very big and is, doesn't have a blade stop behind it. However, those knives are specifically designed to be held with your finger in that choil. Got you. Like that, that is a part of the handle. It's not an option. It's the, the way it's meant to be gripped. Yeah. You know, it, the, the viewers and followers and video watchers and stuff, they all think that, I don't know, they think you're supposed to have two options and you don't have to choke up on the knife. But really, I do believe every knife we've designed is really designed to be, have your hand in that, what they call a choked up position. Mm hmm. Uh, but have your finger in that choil. Well, I noticed on the Roxy 4, uh, if your finger is up in the choil, which is kind of how it seems to be designed, you still have a full four inches of edge, right? I mean, like that edge comes all the way back to yeah. below the, the front part of the handle. I think it actually comes out to like 3.8, but yeah, four inches. Okay, yeah. I mean, you're, you're, you're close to having an entire uh, length of the blade to cut with, with your finger in that choil. Yeah. And and I think, I don't know that we've designed very many at all that don't have that. Like this is, and I know the viewers can't see this, but this is the Roxy 3. This will probably go into production with Wii at some point in the next year and a half or so. And this is a non-flipping knife. It uses a roller lock opening mechanism. But you'll see even on that, it's designed to be held in here in that forward choil. Describe what it's been like. You mentioned Wii. What has it been like working with... Um... We and and the other uh, you know foreign manufacturers that you've worked with, and what do you think they've done for the industry in general? Oh boy, working with We can be a joy and a frustration. They make excellent, excellent knives, and but the the problem comes in in the initial. Our knives are different from everyone else's. One, our CAD files, not on the first one or two, but our CAD files anymore are pretty much done. Mm. I, you could put them in CAM if you knew how to mess with CAM, and you could go and produce the knife. And the one of the problems that we do have is their CAD people, because they we use Fusion 360, and then they transfer it over to SolidWorks, mm. a different CAD package uh, for their machines. And also, they have to get it translated to Chinese, of course, right. uh, with the SolidWorks. And the problems come in at that point. With we, they can sometimes be frustrating, but they usually get... We've got a lady over there. Uh, we can call her outdoors. She gets things smoothed out generally fairly quickly. Yeah. I mean, they, they do a good job. I mean, they do an amazing job on the knives. So does yes. Best Tech. Um I, it's a little bit of a different feel, but uh, other than the fact that they're so popular and they have such a backlog that if, if we, like we've got two knives with them supposed to be going to production now, give you an example. I think the Roxy was right at two, two and a quarter years before it hit production. Something yeah. right at two years, something like that. Yeah. So other than the timeline, I mean, they do a really good job to Terrell's point. It can be frustrating to have the conversation go back and forth and try and explain one tiny little change that needs to happen. Oh, yeah. But they're very much about whatever we feel like the design should be. They want to they wanna bring that design to life into production. Very seldom has there ever been, ever been anything with we where they've been like, we think we should change this. Not that right. we're against that. If they got a good idea, let's change it. But 
Yeah, what you get is what the CAD file showed. Yeah, it, it's almost frustrating with Wii that they are so true to the CAD file. A lot of times we would like this to be a collaboration with them, and if they do see something, like a like a third check on the knife design. Right, right. But uh, with with Wii, they are so good that they are so true to the CAD file that it's it's almost scary. Because it makes us a little bit nervous about making sure those CAD files are perfect <laughs> yeah, yeah, before right. we send them off. Uh, whenever we work with Best Tech, it's very much the same thing. Uh, they are a little bit more in the, hey, we think maybe we should do it this way. However, yeah. if, if we've said no, we're not, we don't want to do it that way, they'll back up and they'll, okay, you're the designers, that's cool. How do you choose who to take what design to? How, how do you decide which company gets which knife? How does that work? I don't. I don't think it's uh, necessarily which. I mean, to some degree, we do that. Mm -hmm. There's definitely sometimes where we're like, we want this one made by this company, or we want this one made by that company for this, that, or the other reason. But for the most part, we want the we make the CAD design, we make prototypes, we put them out there on Instagram. People see them, they're like, I want that knife. When can I buy it? We take them, we show them, we, you know, whoever wants to produce them, as long as we feel like they can do a good job and they can be fair to the customer, then um, that's, that's where it goes. It's never who you think, like, like whenever we showed we or best tech, the mall, or whenever we showed we, the malware, it was just like, yeah, no. And then whenever we showed best tech, we didn't even show them the malware. We showed them a bunch of knives. They pulled that one out and they're like, we want to make this right now. <laughs> yeah, and we also, have fostered some very close relationships with the folks over at Best Tech and the folks at We, and some other companies for that matter, but the closest ones with the guys at Best Tech and the guys at We. We know them uh, more than just on a business level. Yeah. Guys. And there will be more in the future. I think it, we're definitely having conversations with a couple of U.S. manufacturers um, to potentially do something there. Obviously, cost and price is a is a concern for people. So we want to make sure that we have a design that people are really going to want. Right. Uh, and then others within the, uh, the Asian market as well. And even, I think what was the one I think, well, Russia, obviously, but right. Another thing that, that will be is, is on the table, but isn't to fruition yet is we, whenever we have everything in order, we will be doing some self branded knives. Currently we just, don't have time, but that is on the table and we're trying to figure out when we're going to have the time because whenever we do that, we want to have one of us free for customer service right. and to be able to take care of the customer. I, In my dealing with the industry, uh, which I deal fairly deeply with the industry and some other points, uh, I see so many of these guys that try to do self-branded stuff and then can't support it. And we don't want to be there. We want to be there for the customers. Right. Well, in, in a world without we and best tech and, and uh, those kind of um, OEMs overseas that kind of make things a little bit uh, easier uh, or more affordable, what would Todd knife and tool look like? What, how would you be producing your work? Uh, uh, go ahead. I mean, I think, Originally, the intent was to make custom knives and just have the one-off. But for the way that we make them and the way that I make them and the fact that I don't make the same one over and over again, Terrell doesn't make the same one over and over again, the price would just be astronomical. And I think some of the stuff that we're working with some of the U.S. manufacturers on is uh, is probably something that we would have gotten to eventually. It's just... It's a lot more risk associated with that. And I think it, it's good that those, you know, the best techs in the we are out there because we're doing this podcast. You get more people, you get more followers, you get a lot of videos up about how knives are good. And then if you do kind of transition into that where you've got a self-branded knife that's maybe produced in the U.S. or, or a collaboration with the U.S. manufacturer, then you've got a lot more chance of not losing at all, because if you're going to go that route, generally you're going to have to come out of pocket a significant amount of money. Right, and one reason we didn't go the full custom route, and I, I still toy with doing especially custom fixed blades. I've got some connections to do some really crazy stuff there. 
but the problem comes in is every time I look at that and I look at the pricing on that, and I'm looking at a three or three and a half inch fixed blade, and I'm going to have to charge five hundred or six hundred dollars oh. for it. Yeah. And I know there's a market out there for that, but uh, we really want to have our knives available for most people. Yeah. When I retire, or whenever Terrell retires, there's probably a definitely a custom market, you know, plan. Lots yeah. of custom knives made. Um, but at this point, it wouldn't even be like, here's open books and here are knives. It would be like, I spent the last three months making this knife. It takes me, with when I can do it, it probably takes me a month to make a prototype if I'm doing pretty good. So it's like, the cost is just going to be ridiculous. And then it would just be like, hey, it, you know, kind of like, I think probably like Derek Monroe, like, what is it, like six or seven knives a year or something oh like that. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, and and he's right. I, I'm, you know, I work for the government, and I'm drawing in on a retirement here pretty quick. And at that point, there will probably be uh, various custom fixed blades and maybe some custom folders, but they'll be very sporadic. There won't be books. It's going to be when it's done, it's done type of deal. Right, right. And kind of buy what you've made, and that's that. Right. Yeah. So what? Uh, how has the industry changed since you've been involved? And not even necessarily since Todd Knife and Tool has been involved, but since you've been um, kind of, well, a part of the Terrell, you a part of the knife community uh, on YouTube, and, and Seth as a knife lover. How have you seen this industry change, grow, evolve, devolve? What do you see? Okay, well, I'll take that one first. Uh, November 19th, 2015, whenever I put up the first YouTube video, there were a handful of major companies, and they had names like Kershaw and CRKT and Zero Tolerance and Medford Knife and Tool and uh, and so on. Shortly after that, the next... Uh, it was 2000, yeah, so it's 2016, the next summer we came about and we knife company changed the entire industry quickly and i say it was them because it was they they came out they come out in atlanta and said we're gonna have 20 knives this year they didn't even have a distribution plan at the point at that point but they did a good job with their design and they did make 20 different models and that caused a lot of uproar in the industry. The uh, other Asian manufacturers came on. The Italian manufacturers came on stronger. The American manufacturers, uh, even the small guys, they changed the way that they were manufacturing. Uh, your XM series from Hinderer and the various other ones from Rick have changed rapidly in the past four years. It's been, uh, well, everything has just rapidly gotten better because of we, Best Tech, Riot, and them producing really high quality knives at, I don't want to say a reasonable price, but a better price than what the U.S. companies were doing and the Italian companies were doing at the time. And it's, it's brought the Italian companies, I don't know that their quality has really come up to par, but their prices have come down. Mm-hmm. The U.S. companies have held prices, but the quality and the manufacturing processes that the U.S. companies are using have went way up, with the exception of Medford Knife and Tool, who was doing that anyhow. Right. Greg, I don't know if you know Greg, but his manufacturing ideas are... You just need to interview him sometime and talk yeah, about it. He's been on the podcast. He's got an amazing uh, process. I, I, I love especially his uh, his whole pivot process, how he described it to me. Yeah, we, we've had that discussion. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I've had a lot of discussion with Greg about pivots. It's, it's amazing, you know, once you really uh, get into a thing like knives or, or anything else, it's amazing how, A, you can sit down and talk for an hour about them, and B, how passionate people get about them. What kind of what kind of reactions have you gotten to your designs from knife people since you've been uh, ramping up your output? 
Yeah, I mean, I, Terrell probably gets a lot more direct. I would say a, a lot of people are probably like 70% of the people that follow Todd Knight and Tool don't even know that I am part of it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, Terrell probably gets a lot more than I do. But I mean, I would say it's been pretty amazing that I watch every single YouTube video. I go through almost every single post from a repost standpoint. And we don't have a lot, a huge following like a lot of people do at this point. But I can only think of like maybe two or three negative reviews. And those weren't necessarily what I would call negative reviews. They were just like, I don't, this is not for me knife kind of situation. And, and people generally seem to really like them and appreciate the fact that we put a lot of time and effort into the things that if you're a knife guy, you notice that a knife guy did this, right? Did this for you. Yeah. Um, in, in terms of all those things on the knife. So, I mean, I, I think one of the, most interesting things about this for me is, you know, going to blade show, meeting all of these people, the people that were willing to help me through the process of learning how to make a knife. I know I talked about a lot of guys who won't, you know, don't want to share anything, but there were a lot of people that did. I mean, there were, um, whenever I was learning CAD, there were some people that helped me a lot with CAD. There were, there are some other designers out there that helped me out with a lot of questions I had. And then there are just some really great people. Um, and that, and the integrity of people and just in general, um, the community is it's one like while people argue and get upset about choils and stuff like that, I would say if you went out to the Twitter verse or the, you know, Instagram verse and you said if you could measure the positivity of a community or a segment of people, I, I'd have to think that the night community is probably one of the most positive communities that there is in social anyway. Uh, I agree that there have been aggressive negative comments uh, from some individuals, especially on YouTube. But uh, YouTube provides this really nice button that I'm sure you know about, Bob. The yeah. uh, the you're gone, but you can <laughs> type all you want button. Right. Uh, yeah. But that's only been a very, very less than 1%. Uh, whenever I do the videos on our own knives, and I explain, like you saw in the Roxy 4 video, what I get most of the time is people that are positive about it, even if they don't agree with it. Mm -hmm. They're just happy that I explained what our thought process was. And that thought went into it. Right. Now, I will say the one bad thing, and I don't, this is going to get, this will probably get a lot of people upset. I get a ton of people, to, you know, posting because I run the Todd Knight and Tool Instagram about people and companies who have ripped off our designs. And I'm always very like, it's cool. Don't worry about it. Like, don't get like, they get all protective of the, mm. of the design and this, that and the other. And you see it all over the place with other people who are passionate about other designers and certain things like that. And the reality of it is this, if you're trying to design a knife that works well, fits good in the hand, and uh, you know, et cetera, there's only so much you can do with. To some degree, it's going to look like another knife that's out there. And I'm not going to get pissed off about it whenever someone makes a knife that looks like a Roxy or makes a knife that looks like a malware. Um, and I don't expect, you know, others, you know, I, hopefully to get all bent out of shape if we make something that is what I would hope to be maybe something like something else, but better or more, not necessarily better, but suited to the specific thing that I wanted it to be instead of maybe what it was. There's a, story, a short story about that one. Dylan Mallory of Mallory Designs, mm -hmm. uh, he's got an Arshio, which is a super cool little knife. Well, actually, it's a big knife. They've got it in several sizes over at Artisan Cutlery. I got this text message from some fan that, uh, and I've got one phone that the, the phone number's out there, so I get these things. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was so upset about Dylan's design. And I'm, and I, I spent a lot of time trying to explain to this guy, whenever Dylan was developing this knife, there's a very good chance that some of that design came from things that I talked about with Dylan. Because we talked a lot about the design as he was going through it. And it makes me feel good to see the knife, because I know that I had a, a very, very small part in helping Dylan get there right. and get that knife produced. And... You know, so yeah, maybe there's some Todd knife and tool influence in it, but hey, it's his design. Yeah. yeah. And it's 
it's both ways. I've gotten stuff where people just try to just rip and tear and post and copy people all over Instagram about some cab design that I posted up about how it's a copy. And it's a copy of something I've never seen in my life. Right, right. Like <laughs> It's like settle down. And and you know what? This has also been an issue in art from time immemorial, you know, especially now that we have such a such a uh, a wealth of information at our fingertips, literally on our phones, on our computers, and you see a million, if you're scrolling on Instagram for five minutes in one day, you see a million knives. That is how people create new things. They're influenced by older things. And there might be elements that you can point to, oh, that's a, um, that's a, a lozenge-shaped opening hole. They ripped that off directly from, from Mick Strider. You know, he's the only one who's allowed to do that. To me, you know, we live in a world, we live in a complex world, ever more complex world, and you're seeing more and more and more and more things. You can't help but borrow from here, from there, or be influenced from here, from there to create your thing. I mean, uh, it's one thing to get a knockoff, you know, to have a company yeah. knock off your design, but it's another thing to influence. I mean, that is, that should be a little bit flattering. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, one of the reasons whenever we got started, I think one of the things that Terrell and I talked a lot about before I actually said I'm going to make a folder was we'd have these knives. So what's your favorite knife? Well, this is my favorite knife, but X, Y, Z. It's like, well, this is my favorite knife, but X, Y, Z. And it's like, if it just did this, or if it just had that, or if it didn't have this part right here, it would be perfect. No, it's not perfect for everybody. Probably the one that's out there might be perfect for most people. But for us, we, you know, a lot of that is influential around there might be two or three knives that were like, I love these things about all these knives and I want to turn that into, you know, super knife. And in that way, it might resemble something that's already out there, but it's going to be different in a, in a specific function or a specific part and piece. If somebody tries to do a direct ripoff, of course, we're going to be upset. However, the 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 only real part of our design that, that we're, I don't know, uh, I can't think of the right word here, but possessive of is the exter- the three holes down around the uh, pivot area and the lines on the outside of the knife. If, if we had someone that was continually aping that, we mm-hmm. would be a little bit upset. It's a signature. Right. Yeah. But besides that, I mean, it, it goes both ways. We, we got to be able to improve upon what's out there, bring our own thing to it, and uh, and if you look at a lot of the popular designs that are out there, a lot of them are classic shapes. And that's because that's the shape that fits in the hand well. <laughs> and that's the shape that cuts well. I mean, we've had several hundred thousand years to, to kind of get to this point, right? Yeah, yeah, you talk about your hinderers, your striders, and all those classic designs. If you look at the shape of them, the actual shape of where your hand is on those two knives are very similar. Mick just doesn't cut the end of his off. Right. You know, he leaves it uh, angular. Yeah. So. Yeah. But other than that, I mean, I think everything in general has been positive. I don't, I don't think not really gotten or seen any, any negative feedback, which is, is good. I know. I won't say who he is, but I have a close friend who is a designer who makes some extremely high end knives that sell for seven to ten thousand dollars a piece. Holy mackerel. And uh he just he gets such anxiety over the bat and this is a guy who has I think he's got what, Terrell, like seven, eight hundred thousand followers or something. Oh yeah, it's it's crazy. And he just gets such crazy anxiety over whenever people rip him on mm. YouTube and on social media. So, I mean, you just got to kind of take it for what it is. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. And, and uh, you know, doing the YouTube thing since 2015, I've got freaking bark skin, iron skin, whatever over that. Because I people are going to say what they're going to say. And it's just part of the game. Well, I, I think you guys should uh, are and should be grateful that you're working and designing and really... Uh, uh, getting to live out your passion in an industry that is passionate. You know, you're not designing wrenches, uh, you know, that very few people are passionate or care about. I have know. designed wrenches. Yeah, and no one's heard of them, right? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> They've heard of the Todd knife and tool knife. <laughs> so you guys have been in this 
for a while. You have to have a good knife story. Uh, we're getting towards the end here. I'd like to round things out with uh, some knife story. Could be funny. Could be scary. Could be just something in in the design process. Uh, all right, Seth. Seth, if if you're gonna tell the one, I think you're gonna tell. I'll tell mine first because it's nowhere near as fun. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, it's been a few years ago for me. I I carry this first aid kit in the saddlebags of my Harley, and uh, I've got a Spyderco H1 Hawk Bill all serrated in there, and I come across this guy that had slid off the road on his motorcycle on a small highway. Springtime, there's gravel on the road. And uh, he's got this, he's wrapped up in that stuff that looks like orange chicken wire that mm-hmm. they put, put around the edge of uh, turns and, and whatnot. Yeah. And he's trying like heck to get out of it. And I'm looking around at his buddies and they're all riding this specific type of motorcycle and they're all just kind of trying to pull on the stuff. So I grab the first aid kit and and cut the guy out. And I'm looking around, and I'm like, well, guys, no one has a knife? And seriously, this whole group of riders, so like eight guys, none of them had a knife on them. That's I, crazy. It, that may have been part of what got me more into doing useful, purposeful things with the knife industry because it, it just blew my mind that they didn't have a first aid kit even with a pair of scissors in it. That's crazy. Well, I bet they weren't riding Harleys. And no. what do they put in their saddlebags? If you're not going to put well, knives in there, I mean, geez. You know, unicorns, fairy dust, I don't know. <laughs> hey, now, come on now. I used to ride MV Augusta and Ducati. So. It wasn't MV Augusta, uh, MV or Duck. Because I, I had the same pack in my on my Duck. Speaking of the Hawkbill Spider Co., there's about a five-inch scar across my arm right there, and that'll be a story for another day. Oh man, that like was it. from that was from a hawkbill serrated blade spider co. Jeez, you don't mess with those, do you? Uh, they're dangerous. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, takes, takes very little, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've got a delica scar across my hand too. I guess I could have talked about that, but <laughs> anyhow. Oh, oh gosh, you guys, I'm gonna have to have you back on just for your scar stories. <laughs> yeah, the. Uh, yeah, we'll go with the malware one. So, and I'm going to jinx myself all the hell here, and I don't have any wood to knock on, but I have, in the entire, like, past four and a half years, I think the last knife I cut myself on was, what was that stupid little spider co that I sent you, Terrell, that I didn't like? Uh, oh, there's been a couple. I the, don't know. The titanium handled one. Oh, yeah, that's one. The M4 one. Looks like a yeah. Delica, but it's a flipper. I can't think of what that oh, thing's yeah. called. Six years ago or something, I cut myself disassembling that thing before I sent it to him. But that was probably the last time I cut myself with a knife. And in all of this knife making, and I see all the horrible videos and Instagram of these knife makers, I have been lucky enough not to cut myself in a significant way, with a knife at least, maybe with tools here and there, right. um, in that whole time. And whenever I got the first malware prototype, um, that thing was so stabby and so sharp. And not the kind of knife that I normally carry, I carried it and I was like, hey, this thing's really good. Uh, I put it damn near completely through my index finger oh the my second god. day. <laughs> oh my god. And then uh, and then I in, proceeded to cut myself with it probably three more times in the first two weeks. Were they pokey stabby cuts? <laughs> Most of them were pokey stabby cuts. I just wasn't used to that big long oh stabby blade. So I always tell people, I'm like, when they buy that one, I'm like, you need to be careful with this thing because it, it'll, it'll get you. Seth, um, I hate to say this, but you did it to yourself, man. I did. I did. In, in, every, in every scenario, I did it to myself. Yeah. And I, I one other one, I would say, so I have a katana here, a knife story. So um, no longer with her. Um, she's not here, but my ex-girlfriend, I have to give, and Terrell probably would too, have to get a lot of prop to, uh, most women, if you're like, Hey, I'm going to make a knife and spend all my time in the shop for the next two years would have been like, this is bullshit. Uh, she was super supportive of all of this stuff. And this probably wouldn't happen without her. Um, I, 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 she- I, I want to break in there. She wasn't just supportive then. She still is. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. And uh, I think the second year for Christmas, I had this, uh, whenever I was a 
kid, Terrell can tell you, I did martial arts from the time I was like eight till I was like 16. And I uh, had switched schools a couple of times in the school I was uh, going to. Whenever you got your black belt, your first degree decided black belt, you got a, a, a sword, like a katana sword. Of course, it was a cheap like mall sword, right? Um, I went and tested, got my first degree black belt. And uh, they were like, yeah, we're going to order the sword, get your belt and everything like that and all that. And the next week, the school went out of business. Oh. And I never... Never got that sword. And I told her this story at, around Christmas. And uh, she was like, well, why don't you get one now? And I'm like, well, I'm, I'm older now. And I'm like, I'm not just going to get a mall sword. It's got to be like the real deal. Um, she worked in oil and gas. And she had one of her VPs was in Japan um, doing a bunch of work in oil and gas. And uh, she had him go out and, and find a place and find a guy. And she had them uh, hand forge uh, Damascus katana blade and have it sent back over here. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, and it's awesome. It is absolutely awesome. And, and he did bring up one thing, talking about her. The one thing that Seth and I have both had with her and my wife is more than 100% support. And that is so important whenever, you know, Seth works a more than full-time job. I work a more than full-time job. And then we're in the shop staring at CAD whenever we're home or making videos or whatever we're doing. And these women have, I'm not going to say they don't ever fuss, but they fully understand where we're trying to go and they're fully supportive of it. And that's, I don't know. You just you cannot ask for more. Yeah, it's... It's pretty awesome. I've I've heard a couple of other people kind of uh, saying the same thing, you know, like couldn't have done this without my wife's support, uh, and you know, I, I think that's great. I think that's uh, that's what the whole point is. Right now, my wife does have a what the heck is that? Oh, she got out of the whole thing. She has a integral bolster M three ninety chef's knife with ivory or uh not ivory the the dark wood the uh ebony oh ebony with ebony handles that she got out of this so mm, mm, she's got a little mm. bit out of it yeah but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah you keep that thing sharp you're gonna make some good meals with that so how do people find todd knife and tool knives how do they buy them where should to tell everyone where they should look you up and where they should go to buy one of your sweet knives instagram at todd knife and tool um, zero, Z what is it? Zellrick 42 Terrell for YouTube for anything following Terrell on the reviews and all of that stuff. Right now, knives are out with We and Best Tech. The knives that are out there are Roxy, the Roxy 4, and the Malware. The Roxy and Roxy 4 are with We, and those are available at Blade HQ, um, White Mountain Knives, uh, you know, Knife Center, all the major online retailers, and then pretty much across the world. I don't know where people are listening to you, but Asia, Russia, most of Europe, um, those those knives are available. In the coming kind of year and a half to two years, there will be the Shodan, which will be out hopefully before Christmas with uh, Best Tech, the Root Kit. Will be prototyped probably by Blade Show West. I don't think me or Terrell are going to be there, but you might be able to see it if you're there. And then the Roxy 3 will come from We also, and that should be out at some point next year. And then the Exploit will be out with Best Tech probably at some point next year. And then the InfoSec will be out with Best Tech at some point next year. Wow, you've got a lot coming out. That's amazing. You're like yeah. the second coming of we. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're not trying to do that many. I, I Looking at the list, you got them all. That's pretty tremendous, guys. Terrell and Seth Todd from Todd Knife and Tool, thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. It's been a real pleasure meeting you, and I always love talking to brothers because uh, I can relate. You guys are making some really beautiful designs, and uh, you got me hooked on the Roxy 4, so I'm going to have to seek that one out. It's a good one. I I don't. I, I just got one actually, but uh, I don't carry them as much because of what I do. I carry the malware uh, yes. most of the time. But uh, yeah, we appreciate it. We'll have to get back into that another time because I'm interested. Uh, but that's for another time. 
Because I'm like, why would you carry the malware over the Roxy? I like the Roxy better. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, guys, thank you so much for coming on. It's been a pleasure. Take yep. care. All right, Thanks. you too. Follow The Knife Junkie on Instagram at theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram. And we're back on The Knife Junkie podcast, episode number 54 of our show, our Sunday interview show. And uh, uh, not only one, but two for the price of one, if you will, today, the uh, yep. the Todd brothers, Terrell and Seth. Great interview there with uh, Todd Knife and Tool Guys, Bob. Yeah, Jim, I, I love speaking with brothers. We, we uh, talked to the Williamson brothers from... Ferrum Forge. I just love seeing the dynamic and the, the you know, I, I love seeing two brothers together. Right. Because I have one. I, right. I, I was going to say, maybe we'll get your brother on here one time. Oh, man, I'd love to. <laughs> I'd love to. But uh, I don't know if the rest of the world is ready. Well, well. <laughs> yeah. Key takeaways. What was what was the one thing that really resonated with you in your conversation with Terrell and Seth? Uh, well, first of all, they they have a slew of new knives coming out. So they are they are a font of creativity. I think together they bounce stuff off one another and they just keep coming out with new knives. And, you know, as you heard towards the end of the interview, they have, I, 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 I wasn't really counting, but a number of knives coming out from Best Tech and Wii in the near future. Uh, but the real thing that resonated with me is this whole idea of an encore career. You know, sometimes you got to do what you got to do and you have a job and Eventually, the luster wears off of that job. But, you know, when you have something brewing in the back of your mind, you'd like to do later when you're maybe emancipated from that job because the kids are away out of the house or whatever it is. Um, you know, that that's an idea that that uh, I keep close. Right. And to see two guys uh, succeeding at that before they're even retired and uh, and making it all about what they love, which is knives. Uh, it's inspiring to me, you know. Well, as always, if you go to thenifejunkie.com slash the episode number of the podcast, you'll find uh, more links, uh, things like that, that we try to incorporate into the show notes, as well as a transcription of the show if you want to uh, kind of look and read and, and that kind of thing. So that would be thenifejunkie.com slash 54, thenifejunkie.com slash 54 for this episode. Coming up uh, midweek, we're going to do our... Uh, Halloween Eve show, I guess. The day before Halloween, we release the uh, the supplemental, which is what we're calling it right now until we come up with a better name, the Knife Junkie mm -hmm. Supplemental episode. So we hope you'll join us again uh, Wednesday night, Thursday morning for that. So for Bob, the Knife Junkie, DeMarco, I'm Jim, the Knife Newbie Person. I want to thank you for listening to this episode, number 54 of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear Hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Knife Junkie.